Hello and welcome to the um, supplementary part of week one, um, lecture one. So this would be the material that if I was giving the um, lecture in real life, in lecture theatre, so a two hour lecture, um, I would start with this material. So it's kind of a gentle introduction where I cover um, how I got interested in the subject. Um, I talk a little bit about what it was like to be a student in the 1990s, uh, a very long time ago. Um, I talk a bit about the historical and philosophical um, background to time and man's relationship with time. Um, and in, in that, I also cover um, things to do with time travel and ideas like that. So this material isn't really crucial um, to the course, um, but there's some fun information in here. Um, if you're not interested, that's fine. You can leap straight um, to lecture one, part one. Um, so this is just a supplementary material. OK, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to cover um, how I got interested in time perception, um, say something about the uh, wonderfully weird uh, 1990s, which I dearly miss, um, and then I'll cover some historical and philosophical um, background. We'll talk about the different views or different ways philosophers and physicists think about time and how that is similar or different to the way that human beings think about time in our everyday lives. I'll talk a little bit about time travel um, and why the idea of time travel seems to be so pervasive um, and attractive and seductive to, to human beings. Um, and I'll talk briefly a little bit about um, the, the concept of, of time travel as used in psychology, um, so-called mental time travel. Okay, um, so I went to university uh, between, uh, let me think, 1993 and 1997. Um, so this was a kind of years leading up to the pre-millennium and this was a kind of weird, weird time. Um, it's a funny thing, it's, it's almost like a dirty secret, no one really talks about this. Um, but this, this build up to the millennium, um, it had this kind of spooky um, atmosphere to it. Although most people didn't think that the world was going to end in 1999 or 2000, um, that Armageddon idea was kind of in the zeitgeist. Um, and this kind of permeated through our culture in, in lots of weird ways. So there was a fascination with um, aliens and the paranormal and weird things. So one of the most popular programs on TV when I was a student was um, The X-Files, which I'm sure you're aware of. If, if you're not, then do check it out. The first season is still an absolute classic. Um, there was also um, this symbol, which you'd see in graffiti or on, on T-shirts called the schwa symbol. Um, so it was, it was all about aliens or the belief in aliens or just just the kind of um, the cultural icon of the paranormal and aliens. Even if you didn't believe it, it, it in it, it was being um, played around a lot. Um, and, and this this also pervaded um, music at the time. So obviously this was um, the middle period of the dance of birth music, uh, <laughs> the dance of birth music, the, the birth of dance music. Um, so the kind of iconography of um, aliens um, also invaded um, other parts of cu culture, inclu including music, um, particularly psytrance music, which I was into at the time. Um, so although there wasn't this kind of um, religious Armageddon idea, at least not in most people's ideas, uh, heads in this country, um, there was this um, looming threat of um, the millennium bug. So this idea that at the turn of midnight or sometime thereafter at the year 2000 that computers will stop working because they didn't have enough memory um, to store uh, the year 2000. And planes would fall out of the sky and traffic lights would stop working and hospitals would explode and all this kind of thing. Um, and industry and government spent billions um, preventing this from happening. Um, so you had, you had all of this kind of stuff swirling around in the, in, in, in the zeitgeist. Um, also, sort of background to me, if you like, um, when I was a, a, a small child, one of my favourite programmes was um, Arthur C. Clarke's World of Strange Powers. So if you don't know, uh, Arthur C. Clarke was a famous um, sci-fi writer. Um, but he, was a, he was what we call a hard sci-fi writer. He was interested in um, imagining the future, but based on um, plausible scientific ideas. Um, so he, he had this series of programs where they were examining um, reports of paranormal activity, so ghosts, uh, mind over matter, mind reading. Each episode would take a different topic, and they're trying to be, they're trying to examine it in a scientific way, and he'll try and weigh up um, whether there was any credible evidence. And if there wasn't credible evidence, then 
where were these ideas coming from in the first place? Um, and, and this, uh, in the 90s, it, this, this kind of infused psychology as well. So psychology, if you like, caught this millennium bug. Um, the, the, there'd, there'd already been a field within psychology called parapsychology. So this is a study of people's paranormal beliefs. Um, so this is quite important. So if you think about psychology in general, what we're interested in doing is expl exploring the human condition um, and trying to explain the way we think and the way we behave and why we think and behave in the ways that we do. Um, so parapsychology was a way to examine people's beliefs in the paranormal, people's reports of paranormal activity, but, re but examine it in a scientific way, to bring it into the scientific fold. It didn't, meant that you, it didn't mean that you were giving it any credence, but you were saying this seems to be a valid um, human experience. Okay? Throughout the, the ages, people have reported ghosts or the ability, they think they have the ability to, to, to read minds or move objects or whatever, whatever it is, or see aliens. Um, so we can't just dismiss this, these ex experiences. They must be coming from somewhere. Um, so in power psychology, they try to examine these in a scientific way, and they try to put some of the um, ideas um, under the microscope. They try to test them. So my third year project was on um, telekinesis, so mind reading. Um, and it used the Gansfeld technique. So what you can see here is someone who's been put into the um, what we call the Gansfeld um, field or the Gansfeld um, isolation. So it's similar to sensory deprivation, but not quite the same. It has a few sort of subtle differences. So in sensory deprivation, you try and take away all sensory input. So you'd be in a completely dark room. You would have um, no sound. You would ideally be floating in a flotation chamber. Um, but in uh, the Gansfeld, it's slightly different. So here you have um, someone and they, they are listening to either white or pink noise. They're lying down on a couch. Um, they are, um, their eyes are covered in two halves of um, ping pong balls. Um, and there's a, a red translucent light shining on them. So when you're in this state, all you see is a kind of um, f white, sorry, red fog and you hear this repetitive uh, white or pink noise. And the idea behind this Gansfeld technique is it, it's supposed to induce um, particular brain states that were supposed to be, supposed to be associated with um, telekinesis. They're, they're actually associated with um, dream states, or particularly um, the state of mind that your brain is in just as you're either falling asleep or waking up. Um, so essentially, th this, this technique induces um, visual hallucinations, at least in some people. So the idea was that you'd be put into this state, and then while you're in this state, in a separate part of the university, removed from you, someone would, tr would send, um, or try and send an image to you. Um, and then while you're in this state, um, there'd be another experimenter with you. They don't have any access to what the image is. Um, and while you're in this state, you're encouraged to report what images you saw. Um, and at the end of the uh, duration, normally in for half an hour, at the end of the half an hour, they're taken out of the state. Um, th you repeat back all of the things that they saw dur during their um, isolation. And you ask them to take a cold guess. What do you think the image was that you were being sent? Um, and then you did something slightly uh, clever or interesting. Um, you would then show them four pictures and one of those pictures would be the target and you would get them to rate each picture how likely they thought it was the target. Now in the literature, I'll, I'll put a link to this on Blackboard if you're interested, there were a whole load of studies that did this and for a while there seemed to be a statistical anomaly where people tended to pick or rate the one that was the target higher or more often than the ones that were the foils. Um, I'm not going to get into all of that now. Um, but what's, what happened in, the, in, the, in my third year project was that we didn't get a significant result. Okay, nothing happened. Um, so I was scrabbling around looking for you know, what am I going to write in my third year project report. Um, now one of the things I did notice was that when you pull people out of this technique after, after half an hour, um, almost everyone would spontaneously report, um, I can't believe that's half an hour. It only felt like 10 minutes. That's really weird. I thought, yeah, that's really weird too. Um, I, w I wonder what's going on there. So I thought, okay, maybe something to do with time perception, uh, people's perception of duration, time. Maybe there's some 
something else, something I could find out about that. It's not something I'd studied in my undergraduate studies. So I thought, okay, I'll look in my cognitive psychology textbook, which uh, by the time I got to the third year, I should have completely read, but I hadn't. Uh, I looked in the index, can't find anything on time perception. I thought, okay, that's kind of intriguing. What, you think that you know our, our relationship or perception of time would be quite you know important to to psychology? I looked in main psychology textbooks, um, the kind of sensation perception textbooks that you're familiar with, all that kind of thing. Nothing on time perception. Um, that's more or less less still the case now. I thought, okay, this is quite interesting. At, at the time, I, I I had kind of dreams of doing a, a PhD at some point. Um, and if you're looking to do a PhD, what you're looking for is a topic or an area within a topic that hasn't been fully explored. So you've got a chance of finding something new, even if it's only something small. Um, when you do a PhD, your your goal is to make an original contribution to the literature. Um, so I thought, okay, that's quite that's quite interesting. That there's something in that. Um, so that's what happened. I, I ended up the, a studentship came up at Manchester, and I ended up studying time, time perception. Um, but power psychology has kind of fallen um, away now. It, it's um, quite a few people got their fingers burnt. They got kind of got into it, and um, a lot of the things it turned out to be significant weren't significant. Um, and the whole thing's a bit of a mess. I'm, I'm quite glad I got out of it um, in the late '90s when I did. Um, it's it's pretty interesting field. Um, what's good about it, or what was good about it? Um, and a few years ago, I, when we used to have second year projects, I used to set them on power psychology, is that it really forces you um, to be really strict with the experimental technique. So imagine if you're running this experiment and you find a significant result, you can't have anyone accusing you of, of any kind of fraud. So you need to make sure that there's no way the information that's supposed to be sent to this person um, can get to them in, through any other means other than mind reading or telepathy. Um, so, in, in in that respect, it was good training. Um, there's there's a book by Irwin called Power Psychology um, or Inter Introduction to Power Psychology. Um, it's a very expensive textbook, but it is available in the university library. I'll, I'll um, put a link to it on Blackboard um, if you're interested. It's a very readable book. It's it's really quite fascinating. Um, the research that's gone on, particularly since the 1950s, um, all kinds of spooky stuff went on in the Cold War as well. Um, it's an interesting domain. Okay, let's let's start dragging this back to um, psychology eventually. So let's think about the perception of time in general. Um, there seems to be, to me anyway, there seems to be something about our relationship with time or the way we think about time um, that's fundamental to the human condition. Um, we feel time slipping or dragging by, even though time always moves at the same speed, unless you're in some weird situation where you're near a black hole or something. Um, I can talk about time speeding up and dragging, and you know exactly what I mean by that. We think of time in terms of past, present, and future. Um, our language and our grammar reflects this. We think of the past as kind of slipping into non-existence. The future is somehow in shadow and isn't quite decided yet. And it's as if our consciousness glides, through, glides forward or onward through this ever-present now. We're always in the now, which is moving forward. We're never in the past, we're never in the future. Um, and most people would kind of say, yeah, that, that feels about right. That feels what my life is like. That feels what one, my experience of being a human being is like. Um, and we call this view of time, this um, moving forward in the now, we call this the conventional view. It's also called presentism. Um, that there's a whole branch in philosophy about the philosophy of time, and it gets very complicated very, very quickly. I'm just going to give you the the, o the overview of, of sort of characterising the different points of view. So this will be the con conventional view. So th this red line here is the only thing that exists. That's the present. That's the now. And the past has ceased ex to exist, and the future ha um, doesn't exist yet. And you, mo you move forward in one direction only. Now, this is in contrast with what you might call um, the physical um, view, uh, or what's also called the block universe view. So if you talk to physicists generally about time, they don't recognise there being some special privileged moment called now, and only that has you know, privileged existence. Um, physicists tend to think as of all of time laid out, past, present and future, in a timescape. Even though some of it might not be accessible to you, it's all there already. Um, completely absent from this description of nature is anything that singles, singles out a privileged special moment as the present. 
or any process that will systematically turn events into the present, then the past, or future events into the present and then the past. Um, for the physicist, time doesn't pass or flow. Okay, it's called the block universe view. Okay, so everything that um, has existed, everything that will exist, all exists. Okay, let's put that a different way. The past and the future are already laid out; they already exist, but you're moving through it in the now, um, from one direction to another. So you're just experiencing that which already exists. And this is called the, the block universe view or eternalism. Uh, as I say, th this, these uh, broad ideas, they kind of represent an underlying debate within philosoph philosophy, which I'm not qualified to go into. Um, I will give you a little link on Blackboard um, to a, a time philosopher that I know, um, giving a little talk about this, if you want to know a little bit more about it. He, he probably expresses it more elegantly than I do. I'm not, I'm not a philosopher. So anyway, it represents this, this idea, the difference between presentism and eternalism. In, pres in presentism, only things in the present exist. But in etern eternalism, things in the past, so dinosaurs, your breakfast this morning, um, the future, the first sentient robots, Christmas morning 2244, your deathbed, okay, they all exist too. Okay, they all, they there isn't some privileged level of existence. There is a third alternative, and this is where um, the past and the present exist, uh, let's just sort this out. Um, the past and the present exist, but but not the future. So this is called the growing block. So as you for, as you as you move forward in time, as a now moves forward in time, um, it, it creates this growing block. Okay? It re reveals or cause brings into existence the future. So the past and present exist, but not the future. Um, other interesting histo historical ideas around time. So. We use quite poetic words about time, so the idea of time flowing or passing or flying or uncovering old secrets. Um, we're familiar with this language around time, um, but it wasn't used in this way until around 500 BC um, when Greek poets start, started using time as a metaphor or time as if time has some agency or it can do things. So it, seem, it seems natural to us, but it's, it's, it's modern... It's relatively modern. Uh, it's relatively recently modern. <laughs> uh, okay, let's talk about um, time travel. Um, now, for the first few years when I ran this course, um, I, I never talked about this topic, even in the sort of fun introduction to the course, because um, I, I thought of it as being just so far removed from, from um, what I study and what, what I uh, research and what I talk about. Um, but people people are fascinated with this idea. It's a pervasive idea. This idea of time travel, um, not just modern, but if you, if in a moment we'll look at it historically. Um, there seems to be some obsession with this idea of time travel. And again, going back to what I said earlier, um, as psychologists, we should always be looking around us um, at the things that humans being beings think about. Um, and the way in which they behave, and, and what underlies that thought process, what underlies that behaviour, you know, it'd be interesting to know. Um, so time travel is no different. Okay, at the moment we don't think we can we can actually time travel. Okay, so it's all um, thought experiments and fiction, um, but it's something that human beings are interested in. So why are they interested in this? You know, this is a valid question for us to look at. Um, and it, if you take a look, I even just the quickest look over culture in relatively modern culture, whether it's films or books or music, then this idea of time travel is is, is really common. Okay, it's a really common part of storytelling, if you like. Um, so you can see I've just written down there, and it, di it didn't take me very long to come up with this list. Um, it's it's no, by no means exhaustive. Um, if, you, if you talk about sci-fi, then you know, the list is even greater. Why are we interested in this? Why is this a, 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 such an obsession? Well, one idea, um, and this is quite a dark idea, I guess, but um, we can't ignore the darkness if we talk about human psychology. Um, what makes humans different from animals, or arguably most animals, is that we're aware of our own mortality. We're aware of the fact that we're going to die one day. We're also aware of the fact that there was all this time that went on before we were born um, that we missed. So it's led some people to, to propose that, you know, essentially we are aware that we live in a temporal prison. 
what do I mean by temporal prison? What I mean is um, everything that ever was before you were born, you'll never get to experience, apart from recordings. Okay, so you know, video and sound recordings, what you're watching now is a way of experiencing something that happened in the past, but you're never directly going to experience it. You can't interact with the past. Everything that ever will be, all the exciting or even dreadful things that will happen to the world after you die, you'll never get to experience them, okay? You'll probably never get to visit a, a different star system. You'll probably never get um, perfect virtual reality. You'll probably never get to experience these things because they're going to happen um, way after the point at which you die. Um, sorry about that. I might be wrong about some of the technology. Um, one of the things that might come along quite quickly is uh, long uh, lifespan enhancement. So maybe you will get to experience more things that you, than you might do. Um, you might. I'm not sure about me. <laughs> Um, so the idea is maybe um, this obsession with time travel is is the, a, a kind of wish fulfilment, wishing you could break out this temporal prison, wishing you could visit past events and perhaps in, interfere with them, change them in some way, or just witness them, um, or to visit, you know, what what's going to happen in the future? What's going to happen in a thousand years' time? You know, you'd be interested to know. So maybe time travel is, is, is tapping into some of this. If you look at this idea of time travel um, historically and try, try and find the earliest accounts of it, um, then what's interesting is that they're all forward time travel variants. So they're all people moving forward in time. Um, and they're all really um, sort of moving forward in time um, because you've, you've been moved to some place where time, tra time moves at a different speed. Um, so typically you'll find them in um, religious texts where... Um, someone will travel to heaven. Um, and while they're in heaven, they're not in heaven for very long, um, but while they've been there, many, many years have passed on earth. So when they come back to earth, they've moved forward in time. Um, so in Buddh Buddhism, a century on earth is 24 hours in heaven. Um, in Islam, for one day, uh, uh, in, in, for, for Allah, is 1,000 years of what human beings um, count as 1,000 as, 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 as years. Um, there's lots of variations on, on this. Or the classic Rip Van Winkle way, he just goes to sleep in a cave, wakes up in 100 years' time. Okay? He hasn't experienced those 100 years, so in, in a sense he has moved forward in time. Um, but notice there's no technology here, there's no time machine here. Um, and people aren't really seeing the future. Um, they're, they're visiting some um, mystical or religious place. Um, Backward time travel is a far more modern idea, this idea of moving back in time. Um, and these often involve um, uh, being shown visions of the past. So a classic is I don't know, Charles Dickens. So in A Christmas Carol, um, he's, he's shown um, uh, Christmas past, he's shown his, he's shown his school days, um, but he can't interact with it in any way. He can't stop um, the things that went wrong um, from happening. Um, and th again, there's no technology here. There's no time machine. There's no interaction. You're just being shown visions of what happened in the past. Um, the, 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 the first ac real account of a time machine is The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. So that didn't come until 1895. Um, and if you read this book, he spends quite a fair bit at the beginning of the book explaining this idea of time travel and the idea of a time machine because it was a novel idea and particularly the idea that you could interact with what was going on um, and as you all know if, you, if you've watched any time travel film or read any time travel book there's inherent paradoxes if you start interfering with the past how does that change the future if you go back and kill your grandfather and how can you go back in time to kill your grandfather this kind of thing um, if you're interested, uh, there was a um, a sequel to The Time Machine, which was published on the centenary of the publication of the original H.G. Wells one, written by Stephen Baxter. Um, Stephen Baxter is a British hard sci-fi writer. In fact, he's my favourite author, so I'm mentioning him now. Um, and he, he wrote a sequel to The Time Machine, um, and in it, he manages very cleverly to set things up so that these paradoxes um, don't exist. Um, I'm not going to tell you how he does it um, but it's it's really interesting um, Baxter's a fantastic author if, if you're tall into sci-fi and, and particularly hard sci-fi um, he's worth checking out um, in particular these are the books I recommend and it so happens that he, he, he wrote a couple of books um, 
with uh, Arthur C. Clarke, who I mentioned at the beginning. Um, I'd, I watched his programs as, as a kid, another sci-fi writer. So they're, they're well, 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 well worth checking out. Um, my favourite, unsurprisingly, is just called Time. Okay, uh, so that's time travel. Um, in psychology, you'll sometimes see the word, uh, the phrase time travel used. Um, but it, it usually means something quite specific. You'll see it mentioned as mental time travel. Um, and, and you'll often see it, see it mentioned as if it's something that human beings are particularly good at or something that separates us from other animals. Um, although there's, there's growing evidence that this isn't the case. Um, so in mental time travel, you have this loop where um, you have access to the past in terms, you, in terms of you have access to your memories of what happened in the past, your experiences of the past. And this can allow you to anticipate, um, predict or plan for future events, which you then act upon, which will then create more memories, which may lead to better or different predictions in the future. So you have this mental time travel um, loop. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the uh, supplementary material. I, I hope you found some of that um, interesting. Um, and uh, I'll see you on the next video.